Hello everyone, um, welcome to the inclusion and exclusion panel. Um, today we're just going to be discussing what are the effects on student mental health of exclusion, exclusion and discrimination um, in the next an hour and a half or so. And uh, feel free to stay at the end for a breakout room and networking session. My name is Chris and I'm part of the Smart and Student Mental Health team. And um, I hope you find this useful and I'm going to pass over to our facilitator today, um, Sita Badwa. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this panel at the Smartin Network uh, Conference. Um, as Chris mentioned, we're going to be talking about inclusion, execution and diversity. And I think we've got a really great panel of people here to talk about that. Um, and hopefully um, you'll all enjoy the discussion. Um, so my name is Zita Badra. I am the student content editor at Times Higher Education. Um, so I've been doing that job for about three or so years. Um, and my role is basically to kind of create content um, for students on the Times Higher Education website. And a really big part of that is mental health and looking after your well-being as a student. Um, so as I said, we've got a really great panel of people here today. Um, so I'm just going to get the panelists to introduce themselves and to answer a question that we have um, sort of discussed beforehand. And then we are going to open the panel discussion. So we're all just gonna have a chat about inclusion and diversity. And then we'll be taking questions from you as well um, who are watching right now. So um, if you uh, would like to ask any questions then please do add them into the chat box and introduce yourselves. Um, and also if any of you are feeling distressed or concerned by any of the content that we talk about today, we have a mental health first aider on hand Laura Beswick who um, you can contact in a private message in the chat um, and there are also some support lines appearing on the screen as well. Um, there are some pre-recorded interviews and talks with panellists and their research papers which are available on the Smartin website um, and if you are tweeting about this which please do we'd love for you to tweet about um, anything that you hear uh, during this session or any other session that you're watching today then please use the hashtag SmartenConf which is spelled S-M-A-R-T-E-N-C-O-N-F so please don't forget to use that hashtag if you are tweeting or sharing this on any other social media platform. So I'm going to start by introducing uh, Dr. Louise Arsenal, uh, who is the um, prof who is a professor at King's College London. Um, and Louise, I wonder if you could talk about um, loneliness. This was already an issue for students before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but I wonder if there's any initial research findings to suggest what the impact of the past several months have been for student loneliness. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to be here. It's a great pleasure. Um, so we did some research on, on loneliness um, in young people in the past. Um, so I am especially interested in, in that topic. And of course, it became so much of a big issue during the pandemic, um, where most of the people had to kind of self isolate or stay at home um, and avoid kind of social contact. Um, personally, we haven't conducted research ourselves, um, but other people have, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so if you, um, you're probably aware of the um, um, social um, study, the COVID social um, study um, from UCL, which kind of includes 70,000 participants. Um, so it's a, it's a wide, wide group. Um, more or less so representative of the population. But what they show is that there hasn't been any increase in loneliness level in the population um, across even different ages. We don't see an expected increase in loneliness as you know, we could have thought of given the circumstances. What is interesting, however, is that um, young people are always higher. So they always kind of show higher level of loneliness. It's just that it hasn't increased uh, during the pandemic. Um, so there are kind of interesting factors to consider, I think. Um, first of all, is that um, while we were physically asked to um, um, stay at home and avoid social contact, I think that um, there has been lots of initiatives um, that kind of developed to make sure that people didn't feel lonely, even though we were physically um, separated. Um, so that may have helped quite a few people to cope with the situation, knowing that, um, you know, lots of people were experiencing the same thing, that people tried to reach out on social media or different ways. Um, 
So I think that it is important to make the distinction between social isolation and loneliness um, because of that. However, it is really interesting that the levels of loneliness are always higher in young people compared to older age groups. And, um, and I think is, this is really relevant for the student's population, you know. Is there something about being a student that makes you more likely to experience loneliness? And we may think, of course there are, you know, you need to leave, well, several of you kind of had to leave home, leave your friends, leave your family behind. You're kind of joining a big city, you know, where it's difficult to make friends. It's difficult to fit in as well. You need to kind of reintegrate a kind of completely new kind of social network. All those challenges makes that difficult. Um, but it could be as well that there are factors associated with the situation of being a student, but it is also interesting that maybe students could be a subpopulation in itself, um, which could be more at risk of having mental health problems. So one of the question is, when we think about risk factors for developing mental health problems um, or loneliness in the population of young students, are those factors the same as in the population, the, the rest of the population? Or is there something specific in the population of the students uh, which you know, could increase the risk of experiencing loneliness and mental health problems? So, um, so these are kind of questions which I, I quite often kind of um, ponder about. Um, do you want me to go on or? No, I think that, no. Uh, no, I think that that was a really great introduction to that and to, into talking about loneliness and the kind of specific um, factors that could lead to the students feeling lonely, as you said, kind of moving away from home and being in a totally new environment. And also the, that difference between social isolation and loneliness is really, really important. So thank you for that, Louise. Um, I'd like to now introduce, leading on from this, uh, Dominic Smithies, who is the uh, Student Voice and Equality Lead at Student Minds. So welcome, Dom. Um, and so you lead on the Student Minds work on health inequalities. So could you just tell us a little bit more about what that means? Um, what work uh, Student Minds have been doing on health inequalities in the last few years and what kind of work you want to do in the future? Sorry, that's kind of a, a three-parter question there. Yeah, so lot, <laughs> lots of questions to get there. me going. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I suppose first to, to kick off with the first one, what, what is health inequality? So Louise just started talking about looking at students as a population in and of themselves, but I suppose to take that a step further, we have to first acknowledge that students aren't obviously a homogenous population. Um, within um, the student population, there are going to be a range of different uh, communities and identities that will, of course, mean um, people having a range of different experiences. And with that comes a range of different risk factors to developing um, mental health challenges, as well as there being uh, different protective factors for, for various different groups. So um, we know that some groups will um, have adversely have adversely experienced some things that others won't or um there might be shared experiences so with with teaching with um living in halls of residence with their social life that they all experience but will experience it in different ways so we have to be i think quite nuanced in this and when we talk about health and uh, inequality is we try to um adopt an intersectional approach to all of the work we do just to be mindful of the fact that none of the work that anyone across the higher education community is going to do on students is going to um, kind of land perfectly right with every student. You are going to have to, um, I suppose, have a, a range of approaches, a range of interventions, a range of tactics, policies, strategies that meet the different needs of the different populations. So that's that's what we mean when we talk about inequalities, um, having tailored approaches to meeting the, the, the gaps, different gaps that, that exist within the population. Um, so I suppose to, to try and whittle through all, all that we've done and where we're planning to go in a short introduction is uh, potentially a, a bit too ambitious, but I'll, I'll just tease, I'll plug a few things um, for now and hopefully we'll be able to um, come back on them later on in, in discussion. So um, as Student Minds, we've had uh, understanding and addressing health inequalities as a strategic focus of ours for a number of years now. Um, in all the time I've been here at least, which has been, um, about three and a half, so uh, CETA, I think we're about uh, similar lengths of time working in our respective organisations. Um, 
and what we've done in, in the time since I've been here, so we've done a piece of research that's looked at the experiences of LGBTQ students, um, understanding their particular um, experiences within higher education, um, what's been helpful for them, what's been challenging for them. Um, we worked uh, to develop and produce a website called the um, Wellbeing Thesis, which is a range of um, resources and content for postgrad research students around mental health. Uh, we've been for the last uh, about two and a half years, we've been co-producing with a range, a number of male students to develop student-led interventions for male student mental health. Um, they've recently launched a podcast called um, Changing Mentality, which uh, I have to plug. It's on, it exists on all the places you can usually listen to podcasts on, um, Spotify and the like, so do, do check that out. They've had some really, really valuable discussions. Um, we're working on a project on international student mental health with OFS that's trying to understand um, the particular pinpoints in the international student journey that, that are challenging, but also what throughout the journey various international students have found um, helpful or supportive that have um, led them to being empowered to feel more integrated or being able to access care and support. Um, and we're hoping to produce um, some best practice guidance in it and a toolkit for the sector in the coming years. Um, and then two big sector-wide programs that we've been leading on, so the University Mental Health Charter um, being one of them, which one of my colleagues I think will be talking about in a session tomorrow. Um, one of the core components within that is around encouraging uh, universities to be taking intersectional approaches to their work, making sure they're embedding, tackling health inequalities into their strategies around mental health. Um, so that's one, one really core part, making sure that it's not just a range of small targeted interventions, but that it's also strategic um, across the sector. Um, and we've also been working with our student union partners as well through the, our student union programme. Um, and I think I just have to just uh, flag and celebrate I think student unions have a really long and proud history of actually doing great work and leading in a range of areas in liberation um, that has to be commended and they are a great group to work with because they're always uh, keen and looking for areas they can continue to develop and grow and do even more to be supporting students from minority marginalized and, and seldom heard communities and um, so having discussions with them about where we can go in the future has been has been really great um, I think I've waffled on for quite enough, so I'll try and, I'll try and stop there, but hopefully I've teased uh, enough things to come back to later. No, that, that was great. Thank you so much for that. It sounds like there's some really great work going on at Student Minds, um, around, particularly around health inequalities. And again, I think it's so important to remember, as you said right at the beginning, um, that every single student is different and you're going to need different in interventions for different groups of students. And you sort of mentioned a few there, such as LGBTQ students, um, male students as well, who obviously kind of historically don't access mental health support services. So I think it's really great to see um, the kind of different research and, and platforms Platforms and ways that you're reaching out to those students. Um, so just before I uh, introduce the next panellists to kind of talk through their work, um, we are going to do a little poll with everybody who's watching. Um, so we'd like you to just very quickly answer, do you feel part of your university community at the moment? Yes or no? So what do you think? Um, it's obviously been a very kind of strange year in terms of being in touch with people and keeping in touch with people. So we'd just be really interested to see if that has impacted in the way that you have felt uh, in terms of your university community or not. Um, okay, so quite, <laughs> quite a split result there. Uh, so we've got 56% saying yes, they do feel part of their university community at the moment and 44% saying no. Um, so that's really interesting that it's sort of almost very evenly split. Um, um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to kind of see your comments, um, if you could maybe add them to the chat box and, and talk a little bit about why maybe you are feeling part of your community or um, why you're perhaps not. Um, so to move on to our next panellist, we've got uh, Manny Mandriaga, who is the Senior Lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University. Now, um, Manny, part of your research is again looking at sort of different student groups. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about in your experience how universities can cater for the needs of the many different student groups um, that Dom has mentioned and, and we've talked about already, but um, sort of international students or uh, BME students or disabled students or, you know, all the different kind of student groups that make up a university student population um, so if you could talk a little bit about that that would be great 
No, uh, yeah, uh, hi everyone. Thank you for the question, Sita. Much appreciated. And following, and I'm really encouraged to be following Dominique's uh, introduction as well, and and, and the work uh, that he does. Um, so yeah, so I feel quite nice to be in this in this space. So um, in in order to respond to your question, I see I see higher education as not a value neutral space. Um, it is a space that's contested. It's structured by race, gender, class. Um, and it, it, I guess it's through this lens in how I have viewed, for instance, the work I've done recently on, on race inequalities and in degree outcomes. Uh, the way I, yeah, the way I have viewed it is it, through, through that lens of, of knowing that higher education is not neutral. Um, so, for, so far, um, the sector for me has not really acknowledged or kind of recognize an understanding of structural racism to explain um, the race inequ inequities that exist within it. And I, for me to do so, in my view, would be a positive step um, in, in achieving some sense of belonging for a lot of the students who are marginalized, some sense of belonging uh, for those whose voices are not heard, um, some sense of inclusion for the benefit of all students to recognize how higher education is structured um, that can actually cause a lot of harm that's being perpetuated. Um, so for me, the sector should be free from ableism, should be free from white supremacy, should be free from elitism um, that causes these kind of harms that, uh, and, and, and symbolic violence that occurs within not just university classrooms, but throughout the, throughout the education within this country. Um, and, and acknowledging that, I guess is, is what I cling on to hope is to recognize it, but also to address it as well. Hopefully I came across and hopefully I'm making sense, but if anyone has any questions or issues, obviously we have a chat and, and you can hit me up. Thanks, Sita. Great, thank you, Manny. That's, yeah, that's really interesting and some really important points um, to consider. Um, so I'd now like to introduce uh, Chloe Casey, who is a, uh, a PhD student and postgraduate researcher in health and social sciences. Um, so Chloe, your research focuses exclusively on postgrad students, um, who we know are a very distinct group who might struggle to get a sense of belonging. Um, what initiatives have you carried out to promote a sense of inclusiveness for postgrad students? Um, hi everyone, um, but yeah you're right Sita, when it comes to postgraduate researchers or PGRs as I'll call them, a lot of research focuses on loneliness and belonging at university because unlike um, undergraduate and postgraduate taught students, um, they don't really belong to a part of a cohort or attend lessons together. PGRs often work alone um, and therefore they don't have the same access to peer support or a sort of student community. So one study recently actually suggested that a third of PGRs didn't feel a part of an academic community at all and that's quite concerning because their sort of identities as emerging researchers are sort of formed by those peer interactions of feeling a part of a group and they often do have this sort of confused role identity between students and academics so when I started my research at Bournemouth University um, which was funded by the doctoral college there I soon realised there's lots of parallels with what the students there were feeling um, in comparison to existing findings and those that had that more social and emotional support from peers and wider networks at the university seemed to be you know enjoying the PGR journey more and getting on better and it was also clear that that support really needed to come from people who were experiencing the same thing as them so peer support seemed like a real obvious mechanism for change so from this, I co-produced um, with PGRs a range of sort of initiatives to trial, um, and they were all based on peer support. So these included virtual wellbeing workshops, um, such as mindfulness sessions, planning your PGR journey, and mentoring. Um, and I also created a sort of area on their virtual learning environment, which was peer led, where they could have discussions with others. Um, and I recorded a sort of range of video blogs with other PGRs just to so they could sort of recognize some faces and hear about other people's experiences and the challenges, especially during COVID when they weren't meeting each other face to face. 
Um, and obviously these ideas are still in their infancy and they'd need to be trialled on a sort of larger group to see if there's any measurable benefits. But I think the real strength was that they were designed and facilitated by PGRs and this really enhanced their relevance. Um, but the limitation with peer-led initiatives such as those is keeping them alive because the current cohort of PGRs might be really great at fostering this sort of peer community, but once they graduate and move on, the longevity really needs to be considered by doctoral college just to see if they want to embed those ideas going forward. But um, in summary, I think it's absolutely great that my university funded this research and I know a lot of people are looking at similar things and I see some familiar names here, um, like Amy and Yelena that are looking at PGRs. So that's really great because they can often be overlooked and there's this assumption that what works for undergraduates will also work for them. So it's really important that universities and research just keep focusing on their specific needs and increasing their sense of belonging. Thank you, Chloe. Um, yeah, I think that is so important to kind of make the distinction between postgraduate students and undergraduate students as they'll face very different and specific needs um, between the two different groups. And as you said, I think that peer to peer support is so important and it can really help um, somebody just to know that somebody else is going through similar things that they are. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so to introduce uh, my, the next panellist, we've got Anna Mountford Zimders, who is a senior lecturer in education at the University of Exeter. Um, so Anna, you have led the national report on the causes of differences in student outcomes, and belonging was a very big theme in this report. Um, so then your recent rapid response work highlighted that mental health implications from the lockdown, how do you think we can enhance uh, greater well-being? And could you talk just a little bit more about this report as well that you carried out? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so various pieces of research that they all point in the same direction. So, and also I want to say one um, other sort of contextualizing comment, which is that I'm a sociologist by training. So I have a tendency to not look at the individual for causes, but at sort of structures, probably sometimes too much. So there's definitely synergy with uh, psychologists. Um, but there are definitely structures that enable individuals, regardless of their individual disposition, to thrive more and to feel more that sense of belonging. And a lot of it is about the interpersonal relationship that people have in their micro context, so daily interactions they have with other students and uh, with staff and feeling supported and getting sort of positive feedback from these interactions. In the rapid response COVID research, we also found that those who had plans for the future were were much more positive and much more resilient in their mental well-being than those who felt they didn't have plans and didn't exactly know what the future would hold. Um, and um, women generally did better, which um, I think that's quite a well-trodden finding in several fields. Um, one thing of the things we have done in terms of interventions, um, which actually started not designed as an intervention, but as a research project, uh, but something we did with undergraduates was sort of creating um, a community of practice and shared sense of belonging by actually having them do something like an action research project. And as a sort of accidental finding from that project, we found that that created a shared sense of belonging um, that is quite difficult to sort of, I mean, it was quite a deep intervention because it was really intense. It was over 10 weeks. We did weekly workshops with them. Um, and as I say, it wasn't intended to be that a well-being project, but it turned out that people told us at the end that finally they could make sense of their university experience, finally they could make sense of why they felt they didn't belong. And a lot of it had to do about, with like, for example, social class and exit as a, quite a relatively privileged university. So some of it had to do with feeling out of place in a place where you feel you don't belong because of your background and because you're less privileged, but feel it just seeing that other people share that experience sort of turned it from a personal experience, which requires sort of personal counseling and cognitive behavioral therapy or what have you to a group experience and made it less personal and then easier to deal with for those particular students. So those are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Anna. Um, it sounds like some really interesting work going on there, so thank you for that. Um, and last but not least, our final panellist, um, Chris, uh, who is from the Smarten Re Student Research Team and is at the University of Kent. Um, I just wondered if you could kind of like 
bundle up your thoughts on everything that you've heard so far if you could kind of talk about your experiences um you know during the last few months and also in terms of um loneliness and you know inclusion and belonging and and you know everything else that we've spoken about so far yeah um well i started my student journey as being an international student and that was really hard so i had limited ability to speak english really and there weren't many um other people that spoke my native language so it was really hard to adapt at first. Um, I felt lonely, I felt anxious to talk to people, I didn't want to invade anyone's space. And I think that's how a lot of people have felt during COVID. Um, a lot of people, that's why I think we see um, why people don't turn on their cameras, they're a bit hesitant. It's just that kind of sense of judgment, stigma and all around. Um, it's just quite daunting. But as a student, I think the universities have done quite a lot to try and facilitate the current, the current climate and it's not easy. I don't think um, any students have found it easy because we feel like we're also not getting enough out of everyone, out of everything right now. We feel like, um, well, I think that's, I'm talking for most students um, here, but it's, it's really, it's really difficult to adapt to just online learning when we're so used to having that in-person connection. But at the same time, having all those negatives to COVID and saying, you know, it's enhanced loneliness in young people. And I completely agree with um, Louise, who said that uh, loneliness tends to be higher in younger people just because we go through so many changes and so many um, I've had to move three schools, for example, and then move to uni. That's really hard on us. But with COVID, um, it's become kind of at the same time easier to connect with people. And we're really lucky to have this ability um, to just click a button and have anyone in front of us at any time and be able to do this here right now is just amazing. Um, so while it has been very um, lonely at home i have to say um it's made me realize how important it is to take time for myself and focus on myself it's made me actually a bit more productive because i have the time to structure and i also commute to uni um so it saved me some financial resources as well i don't have to spend on petrol and, and my time has significantly reduced um in commuting so i think it's important to also look at that in a positive way rather than just focus on the negative things and um yeah it, as an international student it's just those having that sense of community is really important um i think and people have been really open i've had a great experience actually maybe someone who's had a more uh, who's a bit more shy than me and a bit more um not as talkative maybe would have experienced a different but talking from my point of view my university experience has been great even though i live at home and commute and um but it's it's really important <laughs> yeah great thank you chris some, some yeah uh, some really sort of um interesting and important points that you raised there particularly kind of the your journey as an international student um and sort of how you felt when when you came here first um again that transition to online learning which um for some students they haven't really sat well with that at all um and then also your kind of uh, point about technology making it so much easier for us to connect with people I think I've sort of heard this a lot but lots of people saying that if this had happened sort of 20 30 years ago it would have been so much harder to keep in touch with people and potentially the loneliness could have been even worse then so I think things like kind of whatsapp and um, you know lots of different kind of social media platforms have really helped people to connect with one another even if it's behind a screen um, so as I said one of the points that you mentioned was online learning and um, we'd like to kind of put a poll out to all of you watching and ask have you enjoyed the transition to online learning let us know have you sort of had a really positive experience from it have you had a negative experience what are your thoughts on online learning and teaching and and do you think that it's worked for you okay <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so 52% of people have said yes, 
and 48% of people have said no. So again, really kind of um, almost very evenly split, um, which is really interesting. So again, kind of pop some comments um, in the chat talking about, um, you know, why you have or haven't enjoyed online learning and um, again, what your experiences have been on that. Um, so just a quick thank you to the panelists for kind of answering those questions and, and getting the, the discussion going. Um, something again that I think we do need to talk about and um, perhaps Manny I'll start with you um, to kind of kick off the discussion on this is is how we've spoken a lot about student loneliness and belonging but I mean staff are also very impacted by this they suddenly had to start teaching from being at home um, you know they probably don't have that that support from each other as well. So I just wonder if you could kind of kick off and talk about um, the issues that staff have faced. Yeah, um, yeah, like I, I'm part of, if it wasn't for the various WhatsApp groups with colleagues across the sector, I, I, I don't know where I'll be, yeah? Um, Cause, um, and, and like we're totally aware that it's not, it hasn't been easy for students uh, and, and and we feel that we feel that hurt. We feel that pain that students feel, and that makes us in a, in a bit feel a bit uneasy. Um, like a, I, there's this um, phrase, and some of you may be familiar with it, particularly in in, in counseling. But um, like to hurt people, hurt people, heal people, heal people, and it's one of the, so like for me when I am doing these kind of Zoom teachings uh, or or Microsoft Teams. I feel like I need to be healed up for my students because they're not in the, I feel like because of the space that we're in and what we're doing, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's an uneasy space, but it could be, I always grasp on that hope that it could be a healing space as well. Um, so I always desire for, um, particularly in my these Zoom classrooms that I try to think of it as how, how can I make this room a healing room in order for us to, to learn the content that we need to that we need to learn from each other, and if I if I it's one of those kind of like um, the Maslow kind of hierarchy bit like they can't self actualize if they're worried about getting sick or they're caring for a loved one yeah so we need to process that in order to make in in order for any lear learning to occur, so that, that's my kind of thoughts in terms of this where staff are at is because we're seeing that and. And we talk freely about how we're confronting it and how to encourage and affirm each other in these kind of spaces or in a, in a Zoom call and trying to teach and support students that we're working with. Um, right. Sorry, did you have any more to add on that? No, no, I'm processing this myself, folks. So <laughs> let's, let's process together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is still, I mean, this is, as you say, this is an ongoing process and, and you know, this, the situation is still going to continue going for the foreseeable future. So I think it's very much a case of learning to adapt as we go, which is quite a challenge. Um, Louise, perhaps I can come to you and you can kind of speak about, um, to, you know, to what degree staff have been impacted by the last few months. Um. Yes, I think um, I think that we've been similarly impacted, not the same way, but I think that um, the situation um, made us aware about the importance of connecting with the students. So I think that when we are all together in one building, we would tend to not necessarily kind of pay too much attention to that. But because we were kind of apart, suddenly we kind of all became really concerned about your well-being. So as a staff member, as a personal tutor, as a supervisor, I spent so much more time emailing all the students I'm involved with, making sure that everyone was all right. Um, and what was interesting, so which I would not necessarily kind of have done if we were all in the same building, because I was saying to myself, I'm here, you know, but because we were not together, I went the extra mile to make sure that everyone was all right, given the circumstances. And in some ways, what was really interesting for me as a supervisor, personal tutor and module leader and everything, um, was that the students, of course, they are concerned about the quality of the teaching, about the support, but I think that they were mostly concerned about how we cared about them. So it was really interesting for me to kind of realize just how 
appreciative, you know, the students were that every two weeks or every one week, I would send them an email, you know, which is not a lot, but I think that, I think that it did matter to them. And I realized just how important it is for me as staff, supervisor, tutor, module leader, and all of that, it is to let them know that I do care. Yes, that's, that's so important. And I think um, just something as small as an email can really make such a huge impact to somebody else just so that they know that you're there in case they're struggling, which I think is, is really important for, for students to know. Um, Anna, I wonder if you have any thoughts to kind of add to this. No, I think that we've covered all the key points. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to take a question uh, now from the audience. Um, and this one comes from Claire Battle. Um, and she asks, do the panellists have any advice for helping students from underrepresented uh, communities with their feelings of belonging? What can help someone begin to feel that they belong? And the focus here is on what the steps an individual student can take. Um, so Claire, perhaps we can start off with you on that one and, and your thoughts on this. Um, so I'm thinking um, of mostly international students um, come to mind first and I just think the, the university does offer quite a lot of things to help them engage with each other um, but I, can, I can't even imagine how isolating it must have been during Covid for those who are away from their families um, especially PhD students who are doing their research here if they had to stay in the UK without those support networks or the option of being able to go home must have just been awful. I don't have much other than sort of anecdotal things, but I know that the university really did try to um, facilitate those sort of social events and things that we would usually do for international students online, um, and they have been effective and engaged with. But um, yeah, they're just one group I could see it would be really tough to maintain that sense of belonging while online. Thank you. Um, and Dominic, do you have any advice for helping students from un underrepresented communities? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's a great question and one that I think is hard to answer for, for any population, I suppose. Um, I'm not an expert in understanding uh, belonging, um, but I suppose to me, it's just about finding, finding your, your people, really, finding the people that, who are like you, who get you, who you feel comfortable with, who you can be authentic with. Um, and I think one of the strengths of the university communities, I actually, I'm, I'm of the view that for underrepresented groups, I think it's um, often a first time that I can present lots of uh, opportunities for people to find their people when they might not have um, before. Being such a huge community means that there is going to be so much um, diversity to tap into, so more opportunities to find people like yourself, whereas going, coming from a rural background or small schools, you might not have had that previously. Um, and there, there are many different ways I suppose students can get integrated into their university community, be that uh, if they're lucky, quickly getting on with the people they're kind of uh, randomly assigned to in their halls when they start, um, or if that comes later on, and I suppose it's important to normalise, um, I don't think there should be an expectation that you should feel like you belong immediately, it builds up over time, and it grows over time, so whether that's not until your second year that you're really settling in and getting involved in um, new societies or sports clubs or you're getting involved in um, liberation networks. Um, I like to think student unions have something for everyone and most have practices where if there isn't something for you then create it um, and often if you create something if you think there's a need for something there will be others that feel it too. Um, so I suppose I'd just point to your, to your student union if you haven't engaged with them already I think they're, they're a great beacon of community building and bringing people together. Um, so if, if you're struggling with um, feeling like you belong in your university community um, and you haven't found that in your halls, you haven't necessarily found that in your course, then, then do absolutely look at everything the Student Union has to offer. Lovely, thank you, John. Some really great advice there um, in terms of kind of finding societies or different clubs or groups that reflect your interests and, and the groups that you feel most comfortable with. And again, you know, taking the proactive approach, if, if you feel that there's something missing from your university, then create it. I think that's a, a really um, important point to make. Um, Chris, I wonder if you could kind of weigh in on this um, and talk about your experiences as a student um, and sort of what you think would be good advice for other students who kind of feel um, like they don't have a sense of belonging. 
I, I agree with what Dom said that it's kind of about finding uh, your own people, but it's really difficult. So in my course, if we, a lot of people I know have found friends through their course. In my course, there's only, I know three people that do the exact same thing. So it's really difficult to do that. Um, and I did live on campus the first year that I joined the university and that was my mentors of friends. But um, I feel I feel like everyone is in the same position when they join, but no one realizes it. So everyone is really anxious to talk to each other. And um, I would just encourage them to do it. Um, I went to a boarding school before that. So for me, it wasn't as a stressful experience because I had already experienced that um, adaptation period that kind of have having to talk to people and having to interact with them. But um, it's it's important to know that you're not alone and that um, everyone else is going through probably the same thing, if not worse than you think, um, than you, just as just the same as you. And um, yeah, the universities, it, it's really difficult for us to approach them before uh, because we feel like they're too distant from what we experience and um, it's it's hard to go to the whole university and ex expect them to provide personal help. And what Louise said as well, it's, it's been really important for us to receive that personal care and um, having emails. Yeah, we do receive a lot of emails, but when we see that our lecturers specifically say, we're here to help you, we'd really appreciate that. And I think that's a good technique to adapt by, uh, by many lecturers. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. Um, I've got another question here from Heather Sutherland, um, who talks about a group of students that we haven't actually discussed yet, which is um, students who are also parents. So are the panel aware of any work considering mental health of students who are also parents? So such students can feel excluded by elements such as the timings of classes or events or um, just the kind of culture of being at university um, in general. Um, Manny, perhaps let's go to you about that first and see if you've got any thoughts on, on that. Um, yeah, um, I, I, do, uh, I do have a number of students that are, uh, are carers and, and, or have children. Um, I, and it's one of those things, I think it's the same with, um, uh, it's, it's the same kind of a disclosure process with disabled students. Um, in order to get, gain that support, a student has to disclose that they have children. Um, and it, I guess it's one of the, and it's that as, as, as university staff, we don't necessarily know unless they disclose. And, and it's one of those things where, uh, I guess the university as a sector um, needs to have kind of a, a, a space where students are, f are free enough and, and to actually share that information um, uh, with, with, a, with a, a member of staff at the university uh, and then in order to get the support necessary to achieve and uh, and and um, and get the support necessary in order to achieve yeah in the classroom, but also in terms of support and and signposting um, to the facilities and the services that are required in order because it is difficult. I mean, as a parent myself, it is difficult to negotiate, and I can only see and from and hear from my student voices in my head at the moment, telling me how difficult it is now to be a parent uh, during COVID taking care of kids and also doing full-time study. So I do, I do empathize and I, and I know that like I can speak for my university, we'll do, or we'll do their best in order to support the student, not just in terms of the, uh, of, of finding care, uh, not finding care, but finding the support necessary to help the student and encourage and affirm them. Sorry, just, yeah. No, thank you. That was really great. Um, as you say, it's it's really important for the students to work with the university and to kind of disclose if they have any kind of caring or childcare responsibilities. Um, and hopefully, the university can then kind of help them along the way. Um, Chloe, I saw you nodding quite a bit during Manny's um, answer, and I just wondered if you had anything to add to this. Yeah, just as a parent myself, I've got one little girl who's three, another one on the way, and then my husband. <laughs> in Afghanistan so I've got a lot of uh, yeah parenting responsibilities on me at the moment but my university offer um, it was set up by the student union we've got a student parents group um, 
we haven't really had anything go on during COVID, but you know, last year they did a Christmas party where we could come with the kids and just, it's just so nice that they do inclusive events like that, where they welcome your children along really means a lot, but there's also a lot of support on Twitter. If there isn't in your own university, I found quite a few groups um, of sort of academic mums or like PhD parents and things like that. So you know sometimes if it's not available maybe set up yourself or yeah see if it's already out there and you can connect with people online that are sort of in the same situation as you lovely thank you chloe i think that christmas party idea is such a lovely idea to um and also a great way to network as well with other people who are in the same boat as you so thank you for sharing that um i wonder uh if we could kind of talk about we have sort of touched on this a little bit earlier um but we have talked a bit about the, the kind of negative connotations of lockdown so we've talked a lot about loneliness and exclusion um that lots of students have struggled with online learning um but i wonder if there's any kind of positive things that we can take from the last few months um and how we can ensure that those are kind of carried forward um and let's sorry let's start with dom what are your thoughts on that yeah, uh, great question. I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about the flip side rather than just being stuck in the negative thinking around coronavirus because that, that has been um, some uh, really positive things I think has come out of this uh, sudden radical shake-up of what normal is. Um, and I was listening to a great uh, podcast, Brené Brown, we kind of somewhat idolise her in the Super Minds team. I um, don't know if anyone else listens to her podcast, but uh, she was talking to a guest um, and they were discussing the return to normal and just the, questioning that assumption of, do we have to go back to how things were? Actually, are there not lots of um, brilliant things that have changed because of the, the pandemic that actually it would be really valuable to, to keep or at least try to continue to embed? So things we've heard is um, kind of the, the flexibility and with workplaces and allowing people to um, obviously everyone's had to work completely from home in some instances but it's um, pushed organizations to stretch what they can do digitally and to enable people to think about how and where they work and the hours they work to um, suit uh, childcare responsibilities or time of day to make sure they're getting sunlight so they don't work their full day and then when they're going for their um, permitted hours walk it's pitch black and think about when when they can squeeze squeeze it in I think there's been so many conversations provoked about what flexible working is what what can we do to ensure everyone is um managing and uh looking after their, their self-care their diet their exercise their sleep better I think it's provoked lots of these conversations I think although I'm, I'm very conscious online the transition to online with learning and with support interventions um isn't for everyone and I've seen some really interesting discussions happening in the chat I do think there is a value in having these options available um, and I have heard from quite a few staff that um, students accessing support services they've had students who haven't accessed before more students than ever um, partly with the view because of the stress is caused by the pandemic but also partly because of the view that actually going online has made things more accessible to some students some students who might not be comfortable walking into a building or walking across campus when um, but I suppose they're really struggling um, and there's a worry that um, when things return to normal uh, online services are going to go away when some students have found this so valuable are there ways we can have a, a kind of uh, a range of services available so we can meet students at different points um, so they can access in a way that suits them um, and I think just the conversations we've had just as humans empathizing with each other the, the struggles of working operating living um, at the moment I think has has been great and I think it's bridged lots of um, gaps as we had the conversation earlier between staff and students about um, understanding the struggle each other is is going through and, and being mindful of that and supportive of that as as much as is reasonable I think Mammy said some brilliant things on that so I think there are lots of positives lots of things I want to keep hold of going forwards I don't think I want to return to how things were working before because we know that wasn't working for everyone as it was um, but obviously there's there's lots of um, things that I'll happily leave behind with coronavirus as well. Um, but yeah, lots of good too. Great. Thank you, Dom. I think, um, I think many people might agree with you that they probably may not want to return to exactly how things were before the pandemic, um, that they want to kind of take certain elements, as you say, um, such as the flexible working, the kind of this 
empathy that we have for each other um, and understanding that we're all in the same boat and taking that forward. Um, so yeah, some really great points there and so many positive things that we can um, and have learned this year. Um, Chloe, what are your thoughts on, on the positive things that we can take forward from this year? Yeah, um, our university managed to sort of seamlessly transfer all of the um, development sessions and the training sessions for PGR students to online um, and they were actually better attended um, than they ever have been, which is really great. So it does seem that, that that training being available online is actually a lot more convenient for a lot of people who work part time or are parents or, you know, a lot of people doing clinical PhDs where they're, they're also like midwives and then they have to fit in their training around that and attending campus is often quite difficult especially if you've got disparate campuses but you've got to travel between them too but this the social events haven't you know we've tried to do coffee mornings and things like that they haven't been as well attended so i think the yeah the learning and the training side great but the social side it's still just not quite the same yeah I think many people would agree with you on that is that the socializing has just doing it through a screen is just not quite the same as doing it in person, um, unfortunately. Um, but at least we have the technology there to kind of connect us should we want to. Um, Chris, what are your thoughts on this, uh, on the positive things that we can take forward? I think I, um, I kind of touched on that in the beginning of uh, kind of rushed things, but um, I think yeah, having that ability to connect with people, I'm, I'm really hoping that people would carry that forward into real life and when making conversation with people and making connections. I'm really hoping that um, it would be easier to kind of approach people and know that everyone, it's a global thing that we are all going through, knowing that everyone has been there. We've also kind of got a new conversation starter. So I know it's not a very nice, positive thing to, uh, to take away from 2020, but it is a positive thing. And um, yeah, technology is gonna keep improving. And uh, like Dom said, things weren't working perfectly before. So the main thing that I, th that I think we should take forward is how to improve things in the future, adapting what we've learned this year um, and kind of finding the balance between the two, which I know is really difficult and nothing works for all, everyone, but having a mixture of both to suit as many people as possible, as many students would be, I think the best solution. Lovely, thank you. Um, and Anna, any thoughts from you on the, the positive things that we've learned from this year? Um, I think we've covered an awful lot. There is a lot of positive, stuff here um, and I'm also a parent who has experienced a better work-life balance as a result of the current context and um, there are many it, with the outreach and with that type of work there, there are a lot of positives it has made for example university open day so much more accessible for especially poorer students who are unable to travel and also just the logistics of getting to places so there there are a lot of positives, but I think the one thing that is really difficult to recreate in the online environment to the same extent is sort of starting out with a community of belonging and practice. So I'm already reasonably established. So for me, this has in many ways been a blessing um, because I'm meant to give international talks. Well, with two young children, this is quite difficult, but I have actually given international talks this semester. Um, but I think it's really for, professionals, for students, for anyone who's transitioning into a new context, I think um, there has to be an awful lot of work um, into sort of recreating or trying to recreate that online. And I think that is one thing that going forward when we're allowed to meet again in person, that I think the sort of community building is the one aspect that is probably uh, needs to be offline. Great, thank you very much. Um, and as you say, it's sort of been a lot easier for us to travel this year and, and do lots of things abroad, um, which we may not have been able to do um, in previous years. So thank you for that. Um, Louise, what are your thoughts on, on uh, the positive things that we've learned? Um, well, in, in, in a strange way, I think that being so much more aware of the importance of connection, I think that, um, 
we have increased the way that we do interact with each other, which, you know, with what we have at the moment. And what I hope is that as we move forward, I, I agree with the previous comments that, you know, there are some things that we can do online, but that doesn't replace face-to-face -face contact. But as we move to more face-to-face -face contact, hopefully in the next year, that we, that we remember the importance of connection, of, of kind of reaching out to the students and for the students to kind of be able to kind of um, interact, you know, with services um, and lecturers um, so that we feel a little bit more kind of join in somehow. Um, so hopefully this experience will have shown us the importance of connecting. And I think that we did the best that we could right now. And hopefully we will be able to kind of carry this over in the face-to-face -face world. Lovely, thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, Manny, um, with you. And I wonder if you could also just kind of tie in um, and talk a little bit about your your work that you've been doing in kind of anti-racism um, and just add into that some with some of the positives that you've also learned uh, this year. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think a lot of us were affected by uh, Black Lives Matter and that has, uh, kind of accentuated my work in terms of uh, uh, with colleagues who are staff of color, who have to endure the microaggressions. And, and but I, I think there's, I guess there's, there's a community in, 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 in the disdain, I guess, the, there's beauty in the disdain from the, from the sector regarding staff of color and those who are aspiring to be um, uh, academics who are, who are, who are, who are, who are uh, student, people of color. Um, but I, you know, I see, despite all the, the negativity, I think there's a lot of things to cling on uh, that, uh, that helps me cling on to hope. Um, student solidarity this past year in terms of uh, um, like staff redundancies at different higher education institutions across the sector, students showing up on behalf of students, that gives me hope, that collective action. Um, from Black Lives Matter from globally, uh, uh, where we're during COVID, young people still met up in the streets, in University of Manchester, rent strike, um, those kind of things are, have been, you know, we're talking about belonging. It, those, those movements require a sense of belonging, a sense of enchantment, a sense of a hope. And, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and, and I feed off that, that, that heals me and, and, and it's that kind of, stuff that I, I, you know, after this meeting. And so that, that's the kind of stuff I cling on to in terms of the positives in this past year. Hopefully I didn't go on a tangent a bit, but I, you, I think it was, um, I know you want to highlight my work, but I, we, I have written about um, some of the stuff that staff have faced, staff of color in this country have faced with some colleagues uh, in, in the sector. And, but we all, we, we write those pieces of work not to talk about our pain, but to grasp onto the hope. And, and hopefully a lot of the folks in here, I believe, believe are clinging on to that. And, and hopefully I, I conveyed that uh, in this space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manny. That, I think that was um, a really nice note for us to end on here. Um, that this kind of notion of hope that even though it has been an incredibly challenging year for so many different reasons, as you say, the, the Black Lives Matter movement um, throughout the year, the pandemic, um, just this massive shift in the way that so many people have had to live their lives. Um, so thank you so much for that. And, and I hope you'll all agree that um, hope is and solidarity is is something that we should definitely take moving forward um so unfortunately i think that's just about time uh, all that we've got time for today um i'm afraid we couldn't get to all the questions that you asked but thank you so much for asking all of them you can see that we've had so so many so hopefully we can continue the discussions in the breakout sessions um so i'll now uh, thank you again as well to all the panelists for being here and for taking the time out to talk about this it's such an important topic um and one again that i hope that we'll just keep continuing to talk about um so i'll now hand back to chris who will kind of wrap the session up.